there's a cliche that the ocean covers three quarters of the earth or two thirds of the earth or whatever and only this much has been explored a little bit and that was the cliche when I started out in this field over 50 years ago and it's still true I mean some things have been done but so there's the uh, there's things to find there's uh, there's mysteries still so I I entered the field almost by accident I was a senior at MIT I had to write a thesis and kind of by accident I walked into the laboratory of a man named Harold Edgerton uh, who uh, turns out to be a very famous scientist and uh, he's the one who if you see pictures of atomic bombs going off he's the one who figured out how to photograph those and uh, he met up with Jacques Cousteau, the famous marine explorer. Cousteau wanted to take pictures in the deep, deepest part of the ocean. And so Edgerton built him a camera and a strobe, and in fact, they took the deep pictures in the deep ocean. And the, the device they used to position the camera was a pinger, it was a sonar device. And Edgerton took up an interest in, in these sonar devices. And he, he began working on a gadget he called a mud penetrator. And kind of by accident, I, I asked him if he had anything interesting to work on. And he pointed to his instrument and he said, uh, this mud penetrator, he said, well, maybe you can work on that, on that thing. So I, I wound up taking an interest in sonar and uh, working on his instruments. And I wound up working at his company and so I kind of fell into the whole field by accident. Well, the, the primary product is, is a sonar. It's a side-scan sonar. People learned years ago, working in the ocean, light does not work very well underwater. It gets attenuated, it gets cut down. It doesn't travel very far. So in some bodies of water, for instance, in a, say in a harbor area, uh, you and I couldn't see each other, even though you're a few feet away, it would just be dark. And so. People found out years ago that sound does travel underwater. It isn't. It can travel uh, feet, dozens of feet, even even kilometers, miles. So people started working on sonar instruments way, way back in the, uh, in the 20th century. Uh, when when I came into the field, uh, the challenge was to use the sonar to make a a picture that the eye could understand. I fell in love with a lot of things about it. One is the people. There's amazing people who work in the ocean. And uh, so, but I just fell, fell into it. And I feel I'm lucky. I mean, not everyone finds something that they're passionate about. And I also feel blessed that I, I knew something so I could contribute to the field. I could actually make these instruments that help people to find what they were looking for. So, the ocean is everywhere, and there's also lakes and rivers, and so right at the beginning, and, and when I started my work, I started to travel. In fact, one of my first jobs was to go to New Orleans, and after that job, I, I actually came here to, to England, and I worked on the what later became the, the channel, the English Channel uh, Tunnel Project, and we go back and forth 12 hours a day, on the English Channel surveying the bottom for the, uh, the geology of the bottom. So there's ocean everywhere, so a lot of international, and it's a way for people to get together and learn from each other, respect each other, and so that part of it is very gratifying also. An area that fascinates me a lot, I got involved with my instruments, uh, with marine archaeologists. It turns out there's a huge amount of history under the sea, and I got involved with my equipment in helping these archaeologists look for old ships. There were several expeditions. My old professor Edgerton went off to Inc. to the UK and he worked with a man named Alex McGee and they found the Mary Rose. It was King Henry VIII's warship. They, they restored a lot of it and it's, uh, it's on display. And then I went off to Turkey with a man named George Bass and one of the founders of marine archaeology and I helped him find an ancient ship off the coast of Turkey so I got hooked on the whole field of maritime history and underwater archaeology and I'm still involved with people in that field.
Yes. Yes, in this field, in the ocean field, there are certain things that are talked about all the time. They're sort of holy grails. The most famous ship and shipwreck is the Titanic. One of my friends uh, is Bob Ballard. He um, went on an expedition to find the Titanic, and he had some of my equipment, my sonar equipment. In the middle of the night, on the sonar, they picked up the debris field. Uh, Ballard had learned from his ship, shipwreck exploration that when you have a big wreck like that, it makes a, a field of debris that might go on for thousands of feet. And so he learned that if you can find the debris field and follow it, you, you can find the wreck. In the middle of the night, uh, on the TV camera, they had t constantly running video cameras, a boiler showed up, this wonderful picture of a boiler, and that turned out to be the find of the Titanic. And so there's a lot of ongoing history from that. Uh, I actually did a lot of work in Loch Ness in Scotland. It's a famous place where there's supposed to be a monster. I had a, a friend, uh, an attorney friend in Boston who was wealthy, and he, he would fund expeditions to go look for the monster. And I went along with him. I was a little skeptical about the monster, but we found in, things in Loch Ness that are shipwrecks. We actually found a bomber called the Wellington Bomber from World War II. We, we didn't know we were going to find it. We found it by accident. And uh, it turns out it's one of the only Wellingtons left. So there's still things to find. And there's creatures to find. There's minerals to find. There's uh, cultural heritage to find. Well, what fascinates me most is just how much there is still to learn. There are just things to find. There are, there are historical things to find. There's geology to find. There's uh, canyons to find. Uh, there's undersea mountains to explore. I'm actually involved in a, an underwater robotics program called MATE, Marine Advanced Technology Education, where students from all over the, the country and all over the world now, they build underwater vehicles. And I go, I'm a, a judge and I'm sort of a mentor to, to these amazing students. And one of the things I, I, I tell them is don't graduate. I, I like to feel that I'm a life, lifelong student, uh, that you should, right from the beginning, you should decide to never stop learning. I was very blessed to have this Professor Edgerton uh, and to work with him. And I still, he's passed away years ago, but to this day, I think of, of myself as his student. I'm still trying to live up to his expectations and, and do things for him. I'm also trying uh, to pass on the knowledge that I have and to encourage students to, uh, to keep learning because there's, stuff, there's just stuff to learn. And so have this idea that, no, I'm not done, I've just begun.